Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, as many people have already said on these things, uh, there are a lot of things you need to do to make this work for, for working people. Uh, you need affordable housing. You need good schools. I, I think that gets overlooked sometimes. Obviously, you have a school district that that's their primary job, but the city needs to cooperate to encourage those because that's very important to any working class family. You need reasonable taxes. The word I focused on, though, in this question was working. I think that is the key to everything. I think you need to have strong economic development. You need to encourage jobs both from the outside and from growth on the inside. You need to understand the importance of the gig economy now and the way that people develop uh, jobs in, in the modern economy. You've got to be encouraging. It doesn't mean you roll over for businesses, but it does mean that you are welcoming to them, that you set high standards, and that you work to get them in here because it's the jobs that will make all the rest of this possible. Now, within the specific of affordable housing, you've got that as one of your goals. It should be. But you've got a lot of different things that make up how you go after affordable housing. One of the things I'd be interested in looking at is um, the use of the neighborhood revitalization uh, in, in uh, encouragements in term incentives. Um, I don't understand exactly how they've been used in the past, and there's a lot of detail I would need to, to catch up with. I don't understand the use of them for the apartment complex across from the stadium. There's no affordable housing in that. That seems to be a, um, a distortion of that's intended purpose. I think there are neighborhood by neighborhood places where they, these kinds of uh, uses could be very val valuable. I understand the concerns with East Lawrence, and I think that's a unique neighborhood that's got some real concerns about gentrification in terms of its proximity to downtown. But there are an awful lot of great neighborhoods out there, Indian Hills, Prairie Meadows, Prairie Park, that have good, modest housing that could stand to use some encouragement from the city in terms of these incentives. Now, we need to look at it. We need to work with the neighborhood so we're not the government showing up and saying, hey, we're here to help you. But if it's a good fit, I'd like to look into that. Thank you. How do you interpret the results of the election last April, and how will that influence your decisions as a commissioner? Um, Having been involved in many elections through the years, some of which I've won and some of which I haven't, um, and not just campaign issues, there's also been you know ballot issues, bond issues, different uh, proposals that I've been actively involved with. There are a lot of messages that come out of any election and the results. And you have to be careful not to read too many details into those results. It was clear from this last election that there was the, the general disagreement and the, the trust had been broken with, with that commission and when a representative government loses that trust, well, then you have what happens. And I think that it is vitally important that whoever gets on this commission and the commission as it moves forward works to, re, um, to reignite that trust, to reengage that trust, and to realize the importance of process. Process is at the basis of everything in Lawrence, and you've got to keep that in mind. I think if you go to too much deeper than that into specific, specific issues as far as a mandate, it gets a little fuzzier the deeper you go because each of, you know, for instance, the three of you who were elected this last time, each of you have difference of, of opinion in various issues, as you should. The community does. But you do need to take away the big one, which is process and trust matter. And in all the elections through all the years, that's when people get knocked out is when that, there's a break there. And so I think it's important that we reestablish that, and I think this community responds well to that in a representative government. Thank you. The city of Lawrence has a population of nearly 93,000, and yet on any given Tuesday, City Hall hosts less than 30 citizens at our weekly meeting. As a seated commissioner, what are your plans to engage the community who do not attend meetings in the process? I think one of the things I learned in my eight years on the school board was the importance of any elected person to remember that the group of people in front of you at any given meeting, whether it's an official meeting or a task force or a neighborhood group or whatever, is but a small slice of, of the group you're representing. That's an important thing to keep in mind. And that what I did, which may sound kind of weird, but I mean, when I'd be shopping, whether it was downtown or at Dillon's or at Hy-Vee, Checkers, Walmart, wherever, is to look around and realize how many people you just don't know. We know lots of people. We are all actively involved in lots of different things. And when we run into people, we know a lot. But there are a lot of people in this town who are good, hardworking people who commute, who do whatever. 
and you don't know them and you need to remind yourself all the time so that you're aware because when you're trying to engage a community you first have to be aware of the breadth of that community and then you need to apply or start using whatever formal and informal methods there are the formal ones of task force of putting together groups there are the informal ones of the networks you have and organizations that you're part of churches and associations that you belong to there's the pre-existing groups of neighborhoods of the chamber of all the other different groups that pre-exist on any specific issue but most importantly you have to be open to people coming up and talking to you to be approachable to be someone that they can respond to whether it's through social media or in direct face to face I got used to just being stopped wherever I went because people had questions and they knew I was somebody who wouldn't get my back up who I'd like to listen to them and I wanted to hear it it's got to be you have to be open to it you have to be aware of it and you have to constantly fight it because people have lives to live and it's difficult to engage them and it's not their fault it's not our fault it's just the nature that's why we have representative government so you have to actively pursue it thank you the City Commission has set priorities and goals how will you assist the commission in being able to meet its goals? Um, when I, I looked at the six goals that you have up on your site, I mean, they are very good goals. They are very basic. They are very broad. It's essentially a mission statement. We want to have a good government. And I think that's good. What I don't know, of course, is how you break that down into the priorities and how you get the, the stated specifics into it. And I think that's an important part of how I can help implement those goals. One thing I do bring to the table is having been a senior staff person for a U.S. Senator and for the governor is I understand the difference between the role of senior staff and the person who sits up here as an elected official. And I think that's an important distinction because it is incumbent upon the commission to set the goals, to set the priorities, and then you work with staff who implements it. And then you work together to have regular updates. You have these broad, really good goals, which you need, and I think you have, you have that nice sheet that you update, I think, on a regular basis that's on the agenda that can show all the many things you're doing under each goal. But what we would do on the, the school board was you'd have your, your stated goals of, you know, wanting to educate all children no matter w what their situation. I think they worded it better than that. <laughs> but um, they, uh, then you'd have the board would set priorities for that year for the next year in terms of things that you could actually measure and you could see where you were getting. The biggest thing you did, though, was you remembered those goals, those priorities when it came budget time because your money needs to follow your priorities. That's what the big power you have is the power of the purse. And you set your goals and then you implement them largely, well, through staff, but also then through the budget. If your money's not following your priorities, you've got an issue, you've got a disconnect. And so I think the understanding of how that works, how staff works, how elected people work, and then the importance of the budget process is a big thing I can do to help the board or commission implement their goals. What do you think a commissioner can do to encourage constructive conversations on controversial issues? I think there are two directions you can go with this question. One is the constructive conversations within the commission itself. And I think that's an important level of constructive conversations. You achieve that by respecting each other, uh, listening to each other, coming prepared to the meetings. And the big thing is never questioning the motives of someone who disagrees with you up there. Because you want conversations. You are not going to agree on everything, but you want to be able to know that that person respects you, you respect them, and you're going to listen to them. And that's how you have one at the commission level. The other one, trying to have it with the community at large, has always been a challenge for every elected body in terms of how to get out there and, and get the best kind of interaction. I did this for years at the school board. We had many controversial issues. Some things worked, some things didn't. You can have lots of forums, and you should, but those really aren't conversations. Those are listening to people typically who are pretty angry. There's value in that, both for them and for the board to hear these things. The thing that worked the best for us, I thought, in all the years that we did it, was when we were, one of the controversial issues was moving ninth graders to the senior high school and sixth graders into a new middle school format. The ninth grade to senior high was an issue that fermented for years here and had a lot of uh, animosity of uh, people that were concerned about that. We were the last district in the, in the state to make that move. What we did that worked well was we in invited people into each of the then junior highs we set the community itself around the table. We had board members and staff people at each table. But the conversation was not just them with us. It was the community with each other. We learned a lot of valuable information back from that on those and what people were concerned about, where their uh, issues that we needed to address. 
and they learned a lot about the nature of this community and the fact there are a lot of differences of opinions out there and the fact that all of your friends agree with you doesn't mean that's all the board or the commission is hearing. So that's the way that I thought worked the best. And the other way is back to the answer of how do you engage 93,000. You've got to be approachable. You've got to be willing to, to respond to people, to their emails, and I think that's how that works out. What constitutes a desirable, healthy neighborhood that you would wish to live in? I think uh, neighborhoods are a lot like, a, like people in this situation where desirable and healthy can mean different things to different people. Uh, certainly undesirable, that means a lot of different things. Healthy, you have a range of things that it can mean from a marathon runner to an older person who can walk six blocks a day and is great for their age. That, all that being said is what I'm trying to get at is that one of the beauties of Lawrence is that we respect that the people like different things and like to live their lives differently. And I live my life, and you live your life, and we don't insist that all be the same. And I think that's important to keep in mind, and that's why this, this community, and one of the many things that makes this community great is the differences in neighborhoods. That being said, I have had the privilege of being part of two communities, two neighborhoods in, the, in my time here. The home I've lived in since we moved back in 1988 is one very different kind of neighborhood, and then the one where I had my office for, from two, 1994 to 2007 on East 9th Street. Two very different places, two very great places, but it was great having the opportunity to every day be in both of those worlds and realize that there are common denominators as to what people want. We want to have different feelings to neighborhoods, but we want great sidewalks, we want great infrastructure, we want lights that work, we want safe roads, we want pedestrians to be able to cross the road, kids to get to school. Those were common denominators that you find throughout the community. And I think it's incumbent on the city to recognize there's, there's the common areas and there's distinctions. And when we're implementing policy, when we're implementing making decisions, we need to respect those differences and realize something might work here, but it's not going to work over here. And if you do it all as one blanket and we all need to live the same way, that's not going to fly in Lawrence. And so I think the differences are awesome, but we need to understand those uh, similar areas where we work on the basic infrastructure and make them work in all neighborhoods. This is our lengthiest question of the night, so prepare yourself. Get comfortable. Has my time started yet? <laughs> yes. You will be out of time when we get to the end of the question. Two weeks ago, the Lawrence City Commission was faced with the decision of whether or not to give the Lawrence Arts Center $100,000 in transient guest tax funds for the purpose of expanding the Free State Festival. Two commissioners were in favor of full funding, and two were opposed. As the fifth member of the commission, you would have been the deciding vote to break that tie. Explain how you would have voted and why. Um, my answer I need to preface with the fact that I came in and sat out in the lobby uh, halfway through the video that night, so I, I'm sure I missed some, some information. And there were some questions I would want to have had answered, uh, some of which gets into the, the, the letter in terms of how you had a, th a really good uh, festival this year for 330000 you were losing a $75,000 grant, and you were then increasing it to $400,000. I'm sure that you all got into that, but I needed better direction on why those, those numbers were the way they were. I also, and I say this as a supporter of the Arts Center, all three of my children are, are graduates of the, uh, if that's what you call it, of the uh, preschool there, albeit over at the Carnegie Building. But the nature of the letter was a little troubling in terms of the ultimatum, either you fund this or we're canceling the entire thing. And I, I was uncomfortable with that. Again, that's just based on what I was reading online before I came. Um, and then that being said, of course, the vote was three to one. It wasn't two two, so I'm not sure I would have been the deciding because it was clear. But I know the point. The point was two people supported the 100 and, and two supported the 60, and one was willing to go and to the, to the 60 to make it three to one. So there was some support for the the festival. But when the mayor proposed, after everybody made clear there were two distinct camps there, that anyone interested in, in meeting in the middle, I'm not sure if that was a serious proposal or not, but when sitting here, that kind of jumped out at me as something that might have been considered and I would have asked more about because I was troubled by the fact it was out of budget. When you, every time you make a decision, you're making choices between uh, different really good programs and that's why it's important that it be in budget. You may have had to have a one-year cycle where they kind of caught up because they need such a lead time to do what they're trying to do. So I was uncomfortable with it, but with my you know, lack of knowledge sitting here watching it, that was something that jumped out at me as something that might have, uh, have kind of bridged the gap and moved forward. 
but it is important that these things be done within budget whenever possible. I've learned that through the years in, in my, uh, on the board because there are no really, really stupid ideas that just come up here begging for money. You're making choices. Thank you. Okay. What single issue that this commission has decided did you disagree with? Why and what would you have done differently if you were a commissioner? It's always tempting when you're facing the four vo voters that make up the electorate to tell you that all your decisions were wise and wonderful, but <laughs> that might not be viewed as too sincere. Um, you I do agree that you don't have a, a wealth of decisions since April to, to choose from, and it makes sense given the, the nature of what everyone's been going through. The one thing that I, I focused on that, that I thought I would like to have been part of the discussion and this is, again, based on my reading the tea leaves from what I could. I wasn't at this meeting, so you all would know things that I didn't know. But the, it wasn't even at one of your commission meetings, but it was the, the study session on the police facility. And there seemed to be a split, as reported anyway, between all were supportive of some sort of moving forward with that. Two were pretty interested in moving directly forward to, with it, and two seemed to be wanting to take maybe a step back and try to have community involvement again. And I understood the frustration for the ardent supporters of that because there have been so many studies and so many things done over the five years. I mean, there is a wealth of information out there. I am very familiar with that frustration. I have been through many facility studies. You could go through it time and time again, and then new people arrive, and you have to start over, and it gets frustrating. But I would have been part of the one wanting to take a step back, because what I've learned in Lawrence is sometimes the quickest route to what you're trying to achieve is not the most direct route. It is better to build community consensus, to step back and try. You don't need a lengthy process, particularly if you've done all the legwork already. It's down there. But you need to go to the community and be able to say, we heard your concerns, we've altered the plan to reflect those concerns, and we are going forward with plan B. And I think the plan B is how you often do things in Lawrence. It just takes a while, and you people want to know that you listened to them and heard them. And I would love to have been part of that discussion. For one, I'd be giving you a more informed answer now, because I know really what you guys had said. But the other would be that that would be something that I think would be a good way to, to get moving on this. Because the goal is that facility, they need facilities. We, they are way overdue on that. So that's the one issue that jumped out. Uh, this question is specifically for Scott Morgan. Um, Scott, on question number four, and I'll, I'll, I, actually it's question four in my packet. I don't think it was actually question four, so let me reread the question. Uh, it was, what constitutes desirable, healthy neighborhood that you wish to live in? Um, you responded, uh, we respect that people like to live their life differently. Let me first off tell you, I love that answer. That's terrific. But let me ask a follow-up to that and ask you to get more specific. With that in mind, in the short period of time in which we have, have been seated here, the, the three newbies here, if you will, um, we've dealt with several code enforcement issues. Uh, in fact, I would say we've dealt more with that than any other topic we've had since April. Um, some of these issues have involved individuals who have chosen uh, an alternative lifestyle with, with their property, turning it into a community garden or whatever the case may be. In that you responded, we respect that people like to live their life differently. What would your view be on strict code enforcement? I think the, the important thing is if you need to modify the code, you should modify the code to allow people, if you have a belief that people should be able to do whatever they want with their home. I wasn't trying to, to, to say that. I know that there are some who, who would do that if it's consistent with the neighborhood and the whole neighborhood. Neighborhood is a, a living beast. I mean, it is not just one person. <laughs> And that's the nature of choosing to, you know, making the social contract as a, you know, a government teacher, of, of choosing to live with, within a community and it, within a sub-community is that you choose to abide by certain standards and guidelines. It's a fine line that you have to judge, but I mean, if you have a code, you probably should enforce it. If you need to modify the code because it's too harsh, you should modify the code. You should, that's why one of the things we spent a lot of time on the board trying to get uh, policy uh, through in what we were doing because Otherwise, it was sort of ad hoc, well, we like you, we don't like him, and you, you made decisions that way. And if you needed to change the policy, you would change the policy if something became, if strict enforcement of it resulted in an inappropriate uh, result. Now, you can be essentially a court of equity, I guess, and, and make um, changes in those And if there's a strong reason. 
the bar becomes higher to make those adjustments if it's in a violation of the code. That doesn't mean you don't always, that you adhere to it religiously and, and with some sort of Stalinistic approach. It does mean that you have to reach a higher bar, bar as to why that is acceptable and in violation of the code, whether you need to change the code or not. Uh, would you be willing as a commissioner to use public incentives uh, to uh, assist in the affordable housing question? Um, the, the short answer is yes, but the one thing I would absolutely want to do if I were to get on the commission is I need to get a comfort level with what the policies really are for all the various incentives that are in the toolbox there and how they're utilized. I, I can't find necessarily the rhyme or reason, uh, but I think there are useful tools if we understand what we're using them for and when we're not going to use them. Um, and as far as for affordable housing, as I mentioned, I, that's part of the problem I have with, with the, the apartment complex or, across from the stadium and some of the other uses that we've used on the NRA is how that has nothing to do with affordable housing. And you look at the statute behind, you know, I looked into, well, what is it that the NRA was supposed to accomplish? And I have trouble making that fit, and especially when our policy says 50 percent, you go to 85. But that NRA is a great tool, but it has to be one that is welcomed by the people you want to, the, who where you want to put it. And I think in those cities where they've you know, had neighborhoods and they have buy-in to the neighborhood and you, you delineate the geographical boundaries for them, I think it could be a very useful tool to maintain, you know, it doesn't get into Section 8 housing or that kind of thing, but it does help homeowners stay in their home and maintain the value of their home and maintain the value of your modest housing stock, which is so important for affordable housing. Again, being lots of different definitions from the technical on up to what people view as affordable. If you try to layer it in, and I'm, obviously I'm talking about East 9th Street, if there's pushback from that community and they're worried about it hurting them, you're not helping them. And so I think that it's a tool that can be used. Other cities have done it, and I would be very much open to that. But I'd like to do it within the context of a review that I understood how, what our policy was on, East, or on incentives. There's a lot of discussion uh, going on in Lawrence, Kansas right now about development in the downtown area. The, the the blocks of downtown. And it seems like every project that's come forward has a public incentive package to it. Uh, are you a supporter, can you explain, uh, do you or do you not support the use of public incentives in our downtown district for, for new housing, new retail, whatever it may be? Initially, I would again emphasize that I, I would need an overall review and plan for how we are going to use incentives in general. I think that is critical to how we are going to handle this. I also need to mention it wasn't 28 million, it was 18 million. I love the library, but, and that included, and it was a, included a garage too. Um, I was, worked a lot on that bond issue. Um, but the, with regard to the downtown, the, the fact that we have to maintain that it is the jewel of our community, and we can't just say that so everybody thinks, oh, he likes downtown or whatever. You've got to mean it, you've got to understand it and realize it is absolutely the heartbeat of what makes us Lawrence. And so you've got to figure out what your plan is for that, whether it's a convention center, whether, and it's my understanding in 2020, although with the 50 amendments, I'm getting a little lost, but I'm glad that it's being re revised, and I think that's an important step to update it, is that downtown, uh, there was talk of the need to expand it to into Vermont and New Hampshire. But if you have a plan and you want to implement it, I think that's great. But whether or not you need to provide incentives for that, I'm not convinced of the, of the finances of that. I need to see the but-for test of whether or not these things wouldn't happen even without our financing. And, and we need to keep track of the ones that we already have in place and see how much has it cost us. And I understand that it doesn't actually cost us out of pocket, but it does cost us in terms of, of revenues down the way. And what we're doing with parking, is that included in what we're, if we're providing incentives, are we require, making any kind of requirement for parking? I'm rambling a bit, but that's because I think the city's rambling a bit when it comes to incentives, and they seem to be fairly automatic at various amounts, and I'd like to get it back into a cohesive tool where we think, yeah, we are willing to do this if you do X, Y, and Z, but if you don't, we're not just going to give it to you because we really, really would like your building down here. I think there's a lot of interest in building down here with or without our incentives, so I, I'd like us to put, get a cohesive and logical plan, stick to it, and I would be very hesitant just to give it to, to buildings just along there that don't provide some other priority that we are trying to meet. 
Um, this question was, uh, what can we do as commissioners to ensure that Lawrence remains home to working people of modest means? I believe it was the first question uh, addressed. Um, and your response, I, I, I liked it, of course. I'm, I'm a public school teacher, and you opened your response by saying it all starts with good schools. Bless your heart for saying that. Now, now, now I got to put you on the hot seat for saying that. I know there's always a but. Um, <laughs> you, you were a member of the school board, uh, I believe, the year before I was hired to Lawrence. Um, and that school board is, is somewhat infamous in our community for having closed neighborhood schools. So going back to your question about the way to make sure that Lawrence remains home to people of modest means, and your first step is maintaining good schools, could you clarify your decision to close good schools? Well, I guess I'm privileged that I'm, I'm infamous. That's a, a, for, a form of, of notoriety, I guess. You know, I, the nature of having actually been involved and actually doing things is that you've, you do have a record, and you do have, uh, in this town, a record of making difficult choices. I was on the school board for eight years, spread over 12 years, and was president, cleverly, twice after large recessions, after the 9-11 recession and then after the 2007 2008 recession and we had massive budget cuts and we were deciding how to implement those cuts and we were having to follow our priorities that's what I was talking about when we we're talking about budget goals and we had to decide was it teachers that we wanted to support or was it buildings we had 19 elementary schools when I started on the school board in 1999 one of them had about 35 people in it three of the ones that we, I was involved in closing were legacies from the township school days before we had unification in the 60s I don't think, the one thing I think I would point out is that no school board after um, I've, I've left, and remember I lost re-election because I, when I was president last, the per first time I was involved in closing three schools. I'm Dr. Death when it comes to schools, and it's not a reputation I enjoy. I hate the, the whole thing, but it was choices that had to be made. They were tough decisions that had to be made. And I stand by them because no one has tried to reopen those schools. No one has gone in there and said we need to, to recreate these things. And I would argue that the very thing that I did was the, co was the compromise we reached as a ta on the task force when we did close one more elementary, but then we threw it back to the community and they came up with a plan that put $92 million into neighborhood schools. And I would say that would not have happened if we had kept all 19 schools open. We were able to afford to recreate and re-anchor these schools because we had a serious discussion and handled it like adults. So I don't apologize for it. I think that that's what makes our neighborhood strong is when leaders are not afraid to say, this is our choice. We don't have the ability to raise taxes on the school board. We have to find ways to spend our money wisely. I'm going to suggest at this point that we do the two-minute closing, and then we are going to break about 20 minutes before we start the uh, public uh, comment section. Okay. So, thank you for the oh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this process and to be here. I will acknowledge that I've told more than a few people that I feel like I'm on a reality show, and, and every night I'm trying to decide if I get a rose and and, and whether I should get excited. Um, you have a difficult choice ahead of you. You have six very good candidates, and you just it's your job to figure out what, who's the right fit for you as a commission and who's the right fit for us as a community. And you have an important decision. You know that, but that it came home to me very strongly when I was going through the minutes and records trying to prepare for this evening, and I came across the minutes from April, your first meeting, and one of the commissioners had this quote, we must all commit to working together and building trust with our community and also with each other. This year will be a year that will be dedicated to transparency, openness, and authenticity. Well, that commissioner, of course, is not here any longer. And in fact, he is the reason we all are here. Words are important, words matter. But what ultimately we are judged by who we are, what we've done, and what we do. My wife and I moved here in 1988. We raised our three children here. We have started a business in 1990 and spent 17 years building that business. I've worked at the federal level, I've worked at the state level, and I've worked at the local level. And I would say I've been in the, vetted by the public arena for the last 25 years. I spent eight years on a school board during some highly controversial times and had to make some really remarkable tough choices. And it was, that's where you learn what being on that side is like, is going through extended periods of getting people angry at you and realizing you have to have thick skin, you have to have a sense of humor, and you better not get your back up because these people have every right to be there and to be upset and you need to engage them in that conversation and celebrate the fact that this community is as involved as it is. City government is complex. 
but what is really complex is this community. This community is hurting right now. We have lost our city manager. We have lost our mayor. I think the community is ready to get back to work, and I know this commission is ready to get back to governing, and I'd like to be part of that. Thank you.